What causes autoimmune disease, Sjogren's syndrome, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis? No one knows what causes these diseases. Well, anyway, I was at the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting this past April in San Diego, and I was there very early in the morning at about 6 a.m. My first lecture I was attending wasn't until 7, and being the generally weird guy that I am, I tend to walk up to people and just start talking to them, ask them where they're from, that kind of thing, and I happened to walk up to Dr. Pete de Groon. Now, this gentleman is actually a gastroenterologist. What is a GI doctor doing at a neurology meeting? Well, he was presenting some of his data and his theory about the etiology, in other words, the cause of autoimmune disease, and that theory is espoused in this scientific publication. Now, he gives the example of type 1 diabetes in the article, but it's actually a broad theory that applies to all autoimmune disease. And by the end of our conversation, I was thinking to myself, is this guy crazy or is this guy a genius? So he starts off with epidemiology, the risk of getting multiple autoimmune diseases. And it turns out people with type 1 diabetes are more likely to get a second autoimmune disease such as lupus. And this looks at the proportion of people who have type 1 diabetes who also have either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 other autoimmune diseases. And he looks at different countries. The top graph is in Israel and the bottom graph is in Finland. And you can see in black the observed rate of having zero other autoimmune diseases, one other autoimmune diseases, two other autoimmune diseases, etc. And you can see the observed rate of multiple other autoimmune diseases is perfectly predicted by this formula called ONE, which stands for Omnipresent Neoplasia Equations, which has been used to predict the risk of cancer. And basically, it assumes that there is some external environmental factor that varies continuously in the population that is increasing the risk of, in this case, autoimmune diseases in general. In other words, the observed rate of multiple autoimmune diseases is exactly what you would expect if there was some single external factor increasing your risk of all autoimmune diseases. Now I pointed out to him, although this is true for most autoimmune diseases, type 1 diabetes, vitiligo, Hashimoto's thyroiditis are linked to each other, that's not true for the autoimmune disease I care most about, multiple sclerosis. This is a study on women with MS and their risk of having other autoimmune diseases like lupus or Sjogren's syndrome. And here you can see an odds ratio of one means the same risk compared to the general population, and you can see the data are all over the place, roughly centering around one, meaning no increased risk of other autoimmune diseases. And if you think I'm cherry picking, here is a second article looking at the risk of various autoimmune diseases in people with MS, the left column versus controls, and you can see there really aren't statistically significant differences. The one exception is uveitis. Various studies suggest that people with MS are more likely to get uveitis but for most common autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, there's no increased risk if you have MS. Nonetheless, Pete is still generally right. Autoimmune diseases are correlated with each other. And here's some other ideas which go along with that. One is autoimmune diseases are much more common in some areas compared to others, suggesting there could be some environmental factor. Also, even identical twins or monozygotic twins that have the same DNA don't have a 100% twin-twin correspondence of these autoimmune diseases. For instance, in someone with MS, the risk of their identical twin also having MS is only about 25%, suggesting there could be environmental or chance factors. And people have researched these diseases for years and have failed to come up with any single clear causative agent that really causes these diseases to occur. Also, if you study the lymphocytes, the B and T white blood cells in people with autoimmune diseases, there are some abnormal characteristics. For instance, in people with multiple sclerosis, the T cells are more likely to have a Th1 phenotype compared to a T helper cell type 2 phenotype that seems to be associated with inflammation of the disease. So there's this possibility that some environmental factor that causes all autoimmune diseases may change the characteristics of the lymphocytes 
sites and make an individual person who has a certain genetic susceptibility have a specific autoimmune disease. Now we do know that genes are important and have a significant contribution in the risk of various autoimmune diseases. And the most important genes seem to be HLA or human leukocyte antigen genes on chromosome six. These are highly polymorphic genes, in other words, highly variable from person to person, and no two people have the same HLA genes with the exception of identical twins. And these genes influence how your immune system interacts with the environment. Here are some famous HLA associations where specific alleles or gene variants are associated with different autoimmune diseases. The most famous is probably HLA B27 being associated with ankylosing spondylitis, a rare autoimmune disease that can affect the spine. But the overwhelming majority of people with this gene don't develop ankylosing spondylitis, suggesting there must be other factors. Now what these genes do is code for proteins that are part of the major histocompatibility compatibility complex. In this diagram, you see two cells. On top is the cell membrane of an antigen presenting cell, and on the bottom, the cell membrane of a T cell. An antigen presenting cell could be a macrophage, a type of cell that can consume foreign particles, and then present this peptide or piece of a protein through the major histocompatibility complex type 2 with the different protein variants based on your genes to the T cell with the T cell receptor. So these HLA genes, as I said before, influence how your immune system interacts with foreign antigens, or in the case of autoimmune disease, self antigens that your immune system should not be attacking, and influences how the lymphocytes, the T and B cells believed to drive most autoimmune diseases, how they interact with those antigens. As an example, this is HLA DRB1 1501, the gene most associated associated with increased risk of MS. If you have two copies of this allele or gene version, you have an eight-fold increased chance of getting MS. It turns out that this version has a lot of hydrophobic residues or proteins that are attracted to fatty substances such as valine, phenylalanine, and isoleucine, and it tends to bind the protein myelin basic protein, one of the major components of myelin, the fatty sheath of the nerve fiber that's one one of the main targets of inflammation in multiple sclerosis inflammatory disease. And so it may bind myelin basic protein tightly, present it to T cell receptors, and initiate an autoimmune attack. That's one of the theories of how this gene may be linked to increased risk of MS. So to explain his theory, Dr. DeGroon gives an analogy to colon cancer. In a rare disease, people can have a mutation in the APC gene, or the adenomatous polyposis coli gene. And this leads to people developing extensive polyps in the colon, as shown in this colonoscopy in the picture on the right, and a dramatically increased risk of colon cancer at a young age. And in fact, the risk is so high that often and the colon has to be removed to prevent cancer, and this can be an inherited condition. This mutation is a germline mutation, meaning you're born with the mutation, and in the first cell of your body, the zygote, the mutation is already present and ends up being present in all of the cells throughout your entire body. However, many people don't have this gene but still develop colon cancer, usually much later in life. And if you do genotyping of the cancer cells, there's often a mutation of the APC gene. They weren't born with this mutation. It was a somatic mutation or a mutation that developed in some cells of the body, probably a very limited number of cells later on and was part of the pathogenesis of that cancer but did involve the rest of the organism. And Dr. DeGroon believes this could be happening with autoimmune diseases as well, and I'll call this the somatic mutation theory of autoimmune disease. In other words, you could have acquired mutations in the lymphocytes, the B and T cells, not mutations you were born with. And those changes, in addition to mutations you were born with, and perhaps other factors, could lead to derangement or confusion of the B and T lymphocytes such that they're attacking what should be self-antigens, leading to different autoimmune diseases depending on the specific targets and what tissues they're present in.
And here is a diagram of his theory using the example of type 1 diabetes. So in type 1 diabetes, you can get antibodies or an immune attack against insulin hormone. So here is the insulin peptide or protein. And in the top diagram, we see someone who does not have type 1 diabetes. Insulin can be taken up by the antigen-presenting cells, such as the macrophage or B cell. It can bind to the major histocompatibility complex shown in blue and presented to the T cell receptor, but it's recognized as a self-antigen, something that should not be attacked, so there's no activation of the T cell and no attack against the insulin peptide. In the bottom diagram shows what's happening in someone with type 1 diabetes according to this theory. So there could be various somatic mutations, again, not mutations in all the cells of the body, just mutations in this individual type of lymphocyte. There certainly can be a mutation in the major histocompatibility complex, changing the binding of the insulin peptide to the T-cell receptor, but there could be mutations in other genes. For instance, mutations in histone protein, which binds and protects DNA, and this mutation could lead to further DNA damage, causing other somatic mutations. There could also be a mutation in insulin itself and have a different type of peptide that may be binds MHC more tightly or presents to the T-cell receptor differently, or even mutations in some of the downstream proteins, such as PTPN22, and there's evidence that changes in this protein can lead to abnormal activation of the T-cells, even when binding to the T-cell receptor is more normal. So some constellation of all of these complex factors, and perhaps many other factors not shown here, lead to activation of the T cell and an autoimmune attack against insulin, which causes damage to insulin, damage to the islet cells in the pancreas that create insulin, and ultimately the syndrome of type 1 diabetes. But is there any actual evidence for this theory? Well, in this mouse study, they found that by mutating only three nucleotides, or letters of the DNA, of the insulin gene, which changed only one amino acid of the protein, they were able to reduce the risk of type type 1 diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes, suggesting that tiny changes in DNA can change the risk of this disease. And this study found that 67% of humans with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes had mutations in T lymphocytes that were reactive against insulin. Now, the actual genetic mutations they found were highly variable, but there were a few instances where the same mutation was seen in different people with type 1 diabetes. And this study found somatic mutations in CD8 positive or killer T cells in some people with multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, and narcolepsy. And by the way, for those who don't know, narcolepsy when it's sudden onset and severe with cataplexy is thought to be likely an autoimmune disease. So Dr. DeGruen maybe isn't the only person to think about this, but I couldn't find a huge number of articles on it. And I pressed Dr. DeGruen, well, why couldn't we just do genotyping of autoreactive lymphocytes in people with multiple sclerosis and prove a very strong association with certain somatic mutations and risk of getting MS compared to controls. And the problem is we're looking at a very small percentage of the total lymphocytes. 99.999% of your B and T cells could be normal and you could still get MS because a small number of them are autoreactive and attacking myelin. Also, this is a polyantigenic disease. In other words, it's not just there's one target, there's one antibody we could detect. For instance, in some people with myasthenia gravis with anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of targets in different aspects of the myelin or even other neural antigens. So it's impossible to really identify exactly what is a normal lymphocyte and what is an autoreactive lymphocyte. Also, these lymphocytes, they don't last forever, they die and they're replaced by new cells continuously with different antigens. And there's this idea of epitope spreading. In other words, there's damage to your central nervous system and the blood-brain barrier. And now even if those white blood cells die, they're sort of an exposed antigen. And then your immune system can attack a different 
part of the myelin. So it's a very complex, ongoing inflammatory disease. It's really difficult to pin down this is the abnormal cell. Okay, so what is causing these somatic mutations anyway? Well, some could occur spontaneously. DNA replication isn't perfect. There's some rate of error in DNA replication, but some could be due to environmental factors, such as radiation. And Dr. DeGroon actually argues that even radiation from space, which we can't control, could contribute to a significant amount of autoimmune disease risk. But there are also other environmental factors like smoking, which has been linked to various cancers, or diet, which has been linked to different cancers, or ultraviolet radiation from the sun, or perhaps toxic chemicals were exposed to. So Dr. DeGroon essentially advocates for trying to live as healthy a lifestyle as possible, to not smoke and eat a healthy diet to reduce our risk of disease. And this older study from 2003 we looked at 312 people, 158 with lung cancer, and 154 controls, and it did find that higher intake of vegetables, citrus fruits, berries, along with total vitamin C consumption was linked to fewer somatic mutations in T lymphocytes, so diet may make a difference. So all in all, I don't really know if this theory is true or false. It's very preliminary. There's some evidence for it, but we're a long ways away. Certainly, it's very interesting. And this whole interaction just made me think, there's so many extraordinary people out there doing amazing things. You could walk right by them on the street and never know it. I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Do you think this theory is possible and what more evidence would you like to see and let me know if you have ideas for other videos i'll stick mostly to the topic of multiple sclerosis but do you like these theoretical and speculative videos and do you have other suggestions